Honoured guests, my name is uh, Martin Griffiths. I'm the head of the School of Government and International Relations at Griffith University, and I will be introducing tonight's speakers. Before I introduce the speakers, please join me in acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and in paying respect to the elders, past and present, and in extending that respect to all Indigenous Australians. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first distinguished lecture presented on behalf of the School of Government and International Relations at Griffith University. Tonight is one of a series of events associated with the launch of the new school in 2012. This one, however, is the first of what will be an annual distinguished lecture on a series of topical political issues of the day. May I add that this lecture is being recorded as part of the Big Ideas series with Radio National, so I would ask that you turn off your mobile phones if you have them. Thank you. Mine is on, I think. <laughs> when we decided to launch a series of distinguished annual lectures earlier this year, our intention was twofold. First, we wanted to publicize the school itself and to demonstrate our expertise across a range of political issues, both domestic and international. Second, our school prides itself on the policy and public relevance of its research. In addition to exhibiting this relevance in our teaching at Griffith University, we were also looking for opportunities to reach a broader public audience. I think tonight's lecture should do nicely in fulfilling both tasks, although the question in its title, what's wrong with our leaders, surely doesn't require any great academic expertise to answer. To suggest why there might be more to the answer than a lengthy list of the personal failings of Julia Gillard and Tony Abbott, we're extremely fortunate tonight to have two speakers who have made the subject of leadership, particularly in a democratic context, a sustained focus of their examination. Professor John Kane. Professor Kane attained his doctorate at the London School of Economics. He works and teaches in the fields of political theory, political leadership, and US foreign policy. He has been a visiting professor to Yale University, not once, not twice, but three times. He is the author of numerous books, including The Politics of Moral Capital and Between Virtue and Power, The Persistent Moral Dilemma of US Foreign Policy. Our second speaker, Professor Haig Patapan, he did his PhD in politics at the University of Toronto. His research interests are in democratic theory and practice, political philosophy, political leadership, and comparative constitutionalism. He has published in the foremost political theory journals, and his books include Judging Democracy, An Examination of Australian Judicial Politics, and Machiavelli in Love, A Theoretical Inquiry into the Origins of Modern Political Thought. And John and Haig have a long history now of working quite closely together, although they tell me that even though they like each other very much, they don't agree on many things but they've co-edited a number of books in recent times uh, exploring the changing nature of legitimacy, law, and leadership, especially in Asia. Books such as Globalization and Equality, Westminster Legacies, Dissident Democrats, Dispersed Democratic Leadership, Political Legitimacy in Asia. It's also worth mentioning that in 2006, John and Haig were awarded the Mosher Award for the best article in the prestigious US journal Public Administration Review. Their latest blockbuster, published this year with Oxford University Press, is The Democratic Leader, How Democracy Defines, Empowers, and Limits Its Leaders. Can I take this opportunity to remind you that Kevin Rudd will launch the book in the, G in the QCA gallery following tonight's lecture just next door. Please join us then for the cocktail reception and book launch, and I've been told to ask you to please be careful of the artworks in the gallery case your enthusiasm overwhelms them. I've also been told that tonight that the book is for sale hardback at a special discount just for you, reduced from $80 to $75. I'm serious. So without further ado, welcome to the 2012 Distinguished Lecture. Our first speaker tonight is Professor Haig Patapan. Haig. Uh, thank you, Martin, I think. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, uh, it is a, indeed a great honour 
for both John and me to present this uh, first distinguished lecture for the School of Government and International Relations. Uh, it's also, of course, a great pleasure to see so many familiar faces in the audience, and I want to uh, acknowledge and wish a special hello to our Canadian and Danish friends today. Uh, I must confess I'm feeling somewhat nervous. Uh, the reason is that we've never done this before. We've never done a kind of baton presentation before. So I want to display strong leadership and courage from the beginning. <laughs> and by saying that if anything is amiss, the fault is entirely John Keynes. <laughs> um, on a slow day, when newspapers and TV have exhausted their stories of zany animals who do cute things and deadly dangers in your kitchen sink, uh, journalists usually dust off a story about how much politicians get paid, always too much, how many flights abroad they've taken, always too many, and how much work they do, never enough. And they finish off by saying, this must stop. Uh, despite our prejudices about pollies, exploited incidentally by lazy journalists, I should be careful with that, uh, most of our political leaders, in fact, work very hard. Uh, let me demonstrate with a simple example. This is a diary entry for Malcolm Fraser PM for 30th of May 1979. I've stolen this from a book by our eminent scholar and professor, Pat Weller. Thank you, Pat. Um, he wrote a book on Malcolm, Fra Malcolm Fraser. Uh, we've chosen this early example because this is before the age of Twitter, the web, the Facebook, let alone the mobile phone in the voracious 24-hour news cycle. Notice especially the long day and diversity of appointments from meeting with colleagues to radio interviews, appointment with Governor General to parliamentary question time, then meetings with various women's groups and then his cabinet. All extraordinarily under extraordinary media and public scrutiny. I didn't see a morning or afternoon tea break or even a lunch that I, there did, did seem to be a working lunch there. A very busy day, you have to agree, but probably no different from the one before or the one after. And let me show you that Malcolm Fraser is not extraordinary in this aspect of his busyness, as it were. All our leaders up to the present day could show you equally crowded diaries. We have to admit then that our leaders work very long and very hard. And what reward do they hope for with all these seeming sacrifices? What do democratic leaders dream about when they finally go to sleep after a busy and exhausting day? Maybe they're hoping for something like this. This is a slide of um, President Obama with an adoring crowd. Perhaps leaders long for admiration. Perhaps they want praise, perhaps honor, and even maybe a little bit of glory. What do they actually wake up to next morning? Isn't it curious in Australia how we are ruthless in our assessment of the character and performance of our politicians. Don't we always place our sports people, both men and women, however minor, above even our greatest political leaders? So let me indicate to you how uh, disinterested the media is in the way they attack every politician. So here we have a picture of uh, Julia Gillard compared to Lady Gaga. Uh, Lady Gaga versus Lady Blah Blah, according to the cartoon. Is politics really showbiz for ugly people, as some, some claim? In the spirit of uh, equality, uh, the cartoon shows a big-eared, rock-headed creature with layers of commitments to miners, farmers, and the last layer apparently made of igneous rock, god, and pollsters. Uh, is this how we should see Tony Abbott as a conviction politician? We shouldn't forget people who are going to join us very soon. Um, cruel caricatures follow leaders even in hospital. The title reads for the radio, Rudd's secret surgery extras to fit him for a return as PM. Kevin Rudd's character flaws are linked to his body parts and displayed for public amusement. My favorite, as you can see, is the bigger eyelids for more sleep. We shouldn't forget 
local leaders. <clears throat> we have Candu Campbell, apparently full of energy, yet in army uniform, his previous career, a brave little soldier with sand bucket and spade. What are we to make of this gap between what leaders hope for and what they get? The words of Lee Kuan Yew, the founder of modern Singapore, are helpful in this context. Lee once claimed, and I quote, if nobody's afraid of me, I'm meaningless. When I say something to make it easier for me to govern, I have to be taken seriously. As these cartoons show, we certainly do not fear our leaders in a democracy. And if, as Napoleon put it, power is never ridiculous, then we must conclude that democratic leaders lack power, for they are constantly subject to ridicule. So if the title to this lecture is, What's Wrong With Our Leaders?, I think we need to add, why do we treat our leaders this way? It may surprise you that these questions regarding democratic Leadership have received very little attention. The reasons for this neglect and how we've sought to remedy it are the themes that my colleague John Kane will address now. Thank you, Hay, <laughs> I think. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Haig seems to want us to be uh, sorry for our leaders. Um, they're frequently subject to ridicule. We disrespect them at will. Um, however, let me remind him, since he's pre-apportioning blame to me for whatever goes wrong in this lecture, how often we as democratic citizens feel disappointed in our leaders, sometimes after investing great hopes in them. Sometimes these disappointments accumulate, turn into disillusionment, and then we're inclined to invest very moderate hope at best in our leaders. And sometimes disillusionment descends into cynicism, and we wind up expecting nothing at all from them. Now, may I refer you here, at the start, to the results of the Constitutional Value Survey done by Griffith University's Federalism Project. Made the front page news over the weekend, and can I acknowledge the leader of that uh, project, uh, Professor A.J. Brown, who's in the audience tonight. It's very interesting. The headline in The Australian was, Faith in Political Leaders Collapses. The survey showed that two-thirds of Australians did not believe our federal system of governance was working well, while confidence in the federal government as the most effective tier at doing its job had plummeted from 50% in 2008 to only 29% today. Now, more worrying than that was an apparent decline in faith in democracy itself, with a significant rise in the numbers believing democracy works poorly and a decline in the numbers of those who think it works well. Now, actually, it's one of democracy's great strengths that democratic citizens are free to despise and revile their current crop of leaders while thinking the system itself is the best in the world. Actually, this is one of the uh, great features, resilient features of democracy, which distinguishes it from authoritarian government. Uh, dissent in authoritarian governments is automatically an attack on the regime itself, which is why they clamp down with such brutality when dissent appears, because the regime itself is threatened. We can get away with it, we can insult our leaders all we like, the regime is stable. Nevertheless, it's an ominous sign when disillusionment with leadership starts to infect faith in democracy itself. Deep cynicism about democratic leadership, especially in troubled times, example Greece at the moment, or Spain, is a clear danger to democratic government. Those of you with long historical memories will remember what happened in the 1930s, when faith in democracy indeed gave way to something else. Not at all pleasant. Now, we haven't reached that level of cynicism in Australia yet, but we can hardly say that all's well. We have two leaders in Canberra who seem to be in competition with each other to see who can be the most unpopular. And we have a couple of ex-leaders waiting in the wings, probably indulging a little bit of hope and schadenfreude. So who we trust as a leader, or who we trust more, is currently actually a pressing issue here. Now, these are abnormal times, to be sure, with a hung parliament and so on. Our claim, however, is that the public attitudes on display here are just an exaggerated version of what we call the normal democratic distrust of leadership. We, as democratic citizens, usually hope for a good deal from our leaders. 
but we also typically anticipate our hopes will be dashed. We half anticipate that our leaders, whatever they promise at the start, will disappoint us in the end. Hope, change, audacity, change you can believe in, so on. Why should this be so? Given that we hold democracy to be the best possible political system, if we're Democrats. One we often urge on non-democratic nations. If democracy is so good, then surely it should inspire and encourage good leadership. Let me suggest a couple of possible answers for this underlying distrust. The first accuses the character of the people who go into democratic politics. The second looks at the character of the democratic system itself. And the first ex explanation assumes, to put it quite simply, politicians aren't ger generally very nice people. People who are interested in gaining authority and power are likely to be the certain type of person, ambitious, power hungry, self-interested. Moreover, in the grubby business of politics, they must compete for power with people very much like themselves, whether within their own parties or in the other parties. It's not surprising then that political contest should be dominated by pettiness rather than high-mindedness, by vicious personal attack rather than serious deliberation, by expediency rather than principle. If the prime motivation is power, then a ruthless struggle for power will ensue, leading inevitably to a loss of public trust. Now, we've certainly seen enough pettiness, personal attack and downright bastardry in our own politics in recent times to lend this portrait some credibility. And indeed, it's quite normal for democratic citizens to attribute base motives to their representatives. They love power for its own sake. They have their snouts in the public trough. They're too busy feathering their own nest to serve the public interest, and so on. Yet I'm willing to bet that any citizen, randomly chosen, who became personally acquainted with a cross-section of our political leaders, would find just the usual range of characters you find anywhere. The slow and the quick, the remarkable, the unremarkable, the decent and the sleazy, the selfish and the generous, the aggressive ones and the conciliators, the honest and the corrupt. Honoured guests, Even my the best name is uh, Martin no doubt, Griffiths. We'll have some I'm the head of the School of Government and International and Relations at Griffith University. But if we won't find any pervasively wicked characteristics before I introduce the speakers, class, please join me in acknowledging we must look beyond the traditional personal custodians of the land on which we meet today what's wrong with our leaders. and in paying respect to the we elders, the most past important and place to look is and into in the extending that respect itself. to all Indigenous Australians. Now, we're not arguing that character is relevant, far from it. We all peer constantly through the revealing yet obscuring on screen of, of the media and to try and discern the real character of our leaders. Are they competent Tonight or not? Are they trustworthy or not? Are they sincere associated with the launch of the new school? Leadership character matters to us very deeply as democratic citizens. This one, however, however the first of we want to go beyond that obvious fact and argue that leadership a in a democracy demands a certain kind of leader. May I demands add, one above all being who instinctively understands or at least can learn on the job. So I would ask the unique advantages and constraints and that democracy places on leadership Mine as, as a political system <laughs> and as a political When we decided idea. to launch a series of distinguished What you're saying is that all democratic leaders year, are inevitably forced to confront a general First, problem to publicize the school itself. This is a problem I, I suspect that we all across a range of, of political issues, we never both quite domestic and realize. international. Indeed, the book we're launching after Second, this lecture school is the first, we think, to explore this issue and public in relevance of its research. Let me try to explain the nature of the in problem by relating briefly this how Haig and I came to write Griffith the book. University, we were also Both of us were interested in leadership questions, and Haig suggested one day, audience. why don't we do a book on democratic leadership? I think tonight's lecture should do nicely in fulfilling both tasks, for sure. although the question in its title, what's wrong with our leaders? Although the question in its title, Surely and, doesn't um, require any great the time, academic expertise actually nothing to answer. On democratic leadership. We found to lots of books on why democratic there might be more to the answer than a lengthy list so of the personal uh, failings but on of democratic Julia leadership Gillard, as a subject. We're extremely There's fortunate whole volumes tonight out there, that have two speakers volumes, who have made the subject of leadership. Democratic theory, with not a single entry on leadership. Sustained focus of their now this seemed, when we discovered this whole, Professor John mysterious Kane. and frankly astounding. Professor Kane attained Until, his doctorate at the London School of Economics. Over he works and teaches um, in the fields of we political, thought we theory, saw the reason. political leadership, 
and U.S. foreign policy. There's no contemporary or always he has no been contemporary visiting writing professor at Yale University, University for not reasons, once, not twice, because leadership is a problem times. for democratic theorists. He is the author they of numerous books, including the Politics of Moral Capital, and between virtue and power, the persistent moral dilemma of U.S. foreign policy. And between virtue and power, the persistent moral dilemma of U.S. foreign policy. And between virtue and power, the persistent moral dilemma of U.S. foreign policy. And between virtue and power, the persistent moral dilemma of U.S. foreign policy. And between virtue and power, the persistent moral dilemma of U.S. foreign policy. Abraham Lincoln famously said, democracy is rule of the people, by the people, for the people. In democratic theory and practice. Old Abe himself was a great democratic leader. Political leadership and comparative constitutionalism. But where in that ringing formula is there a space for leadership? Journals, and his books include Judging Democracy. The foundational principles of democracy are simply sovereignty of the people, and which means the people are the true rulers, and political equality. Because the people cannot be differentiated. And John and Hague have a long history now of working quite closely together. Although they tell our famous Australian called like Poppy Syndrome much, is merely a sign of our local but they've devotion co-edited a number of books in recent equality. times, uh, exploring but leadership the almost by definition offends against the principle of equality. Especially in Asia, some above others. Books such as Globalisation and Equality. But it also presents the threat that a strong leader legacies, might usurp sovereignty and rule under the own right. democratic leadership. Political democratic leadership is thus always shadowed also worth by a ubiquitous in and inevitable John democratic Hague suspicion were awarded the and Mosher by a permanent the best article of in the US journal, Public Administration. As Democrats, therefore, we have Their a problem of reconciling two things that we this value. Year with Oxford democracy, with its principle of popular sovereignty, the democratic leader. and leadership, which How may endanger popular sovereignty. How democracy defines, empowers, and we can and see the depth of this problem leaders. if we look at the way contemporary so literature has dealt with it or failed to. We'll launch the book now, I know I said previously that we found almost no literature on the subject, but we did actually find an older literature that went back to the early 20th and century, mid 20th century, I've been told to ask written you by people like Joseph Schumpeter and Giovanni Sartori, who argued for a, what they called elite democracy. I've also been told that tonight, now, in elite democracy, a few superior leaders are chosen periodically by the people and chosen precisely on the grounds of their evident superiority. So without to further ado, welcome to the 2012 election. Distinguished Lecture. Democracy, Sartori said, must reckon with, Hague, and I quote, Hague. minorities who count so much and lead, and with majorities who do not count so much and The American VO Key, uh, thank you, Martin, theorists, I think. argued that we need strong uh, elite leadership guests, to forestall a natural propensity in democracy uh, toward it isn't indecision indeed a great honor and disaster. John and me to present this uh, first distinguished the elitist model implied deep distrust of the volatile masses of people, uh, it's also, of course, and the need to exclude them so many from everyday political processes in the audience. Little and wonder, then, that more democratically inclined theorists felt extremely uncomfortable. Canadian and Nor was it surprising, given that elite theory associated uh, itself so much. I must with confess, I'm feeling somewhat nervous. That Democrats uh, seeking the to that we've evade done the elitist logic tended to ignore the question of leadership altogether. Before. So I wanted to they began instead to explore more democratic forms of democracy, and by with names which I'm sure if anything is amiss, have encountered, the fault is entirely like participative <laughs> democracy, associational democracy, um, and above all, on a slow day, democracy. when newspapers and TV have exhausted never the stories of, of zany word, animals who do to delineate a form of democracy in your that would effectively sink. dilute or even eliminate uh, the need for Journalists storms. usually dust off a story the about how much politicians get paid, always too much. Was it if only everyone abroad could be involved in decision making, always too many. democracies wouldn't need And how much support. work they do, never enough. And now they the problem with these saying, this must stop. Of democracy, the elitist, uh, despite the our prejudices about is that they set up false choice between either strong leadership, such as the democratic, or no um, Most of our political leaders, in fact, work very hard. Uh, let me demonstrate with this. It's as though we're forced to choose between. Vladimir Putin, on the one hand, is a diary government by a permanent 2020 committee on the other. For 30th of May 1979, I've stolen this from a book these are false alternatives. scholar and professor. And they don't help us to understand the way leadership is actually uh, practiced he wrote a book in modern on democracy. democracy. Contrary to the presumptions of participatory Democrats, most citizens continue to see strong leadership before as the age of Twitter, the web, yet at the same time, the Facebook, let alone leaders. the mobile phone most people regard powerful elites as democratically cycle. illegitimate. Not especially in other the words, long-day leadership of appointment to permanent elite. From meeting with colleagues, the inability of either option to capture this contradictory reality means that the middle ground in which with democratic leadership then actually happen. operates and must All operate extraordinarily remains largely under extraordinary under media and public scrutiny. But if Democra Democrats genuinely I didn't see a morning and afternoon tea break, even while being wary of the potential threat they represent, what are they to do? 
a very now the traditional answer have to, agree, to this has been but probably no different okay, than one before well, or the one after. after. I'll try to. And let try to reduce that the leadership risk, risk not by placing our leaders under strict control, and set limits to their authority, all our leaders up to the present day could show you equally The ultimate violence. control mechanism is, of course, dismissal through popular We have to admit, then, that our leaders were The ability to dismiss leaders for unsatisfactory performance and what reward do they hope for that never the people's masters, seeming always their servants. What do democratic leaders dream about when they finally go to sleep after and yet despite this, busy and despite all the other systems of popular and legal Maybe control they are devised for something like this? Nevertheless, nevertheless remains an element of compromise in this arrangement. This is a slide of uh, granting extensive authority President to Obama with an adoring crowd, even if only for some Perhaps defined period, seems to violate the spirit of popular sovereignty. Perhaps they want some have argued Perhaps indeed that between elections, what in reality we're forced to endure is an elective tyranny. What do they we are placed under the temporary the rule of our so-called servants, who often act in ways we don't like. Popular sovereignty Isn't may be fine in idea, Australia, in theory, how critics say, but in the end, it's nothing more than a myth. We are ruthless concealing some rather tyrannical facts of the character. And they will respond to this view by asserting our belief. Don't we always place our sports people, both men and women, and women, however minor, about the even popular sovereignty is leaders. not just a noble lie. Nor is it a sound ideal that hasn't quite been realised. So let me indicate to you it's rather how a principle that operates uh, continuously to both enable and constrain in the way they the attack every politician in a democracy. So here we have a picture of fundamental tension uh, between Julia Gillard and compared to Lady Gaga. Gaga. Uh, and Lady as as Gaga versus Lady Gaga, according away. to the cartoon. Its effects are most clearly seen in, we say, people as in the way democratic leaders pain. conduct themselves and have in to the conduct spirit themselves of, uh, as they do their best to lead. This is our central uh, argument. The cartoon this shows democratic a big tension makes the ground on which the democratic leader stands perpetually with insecure. layers of commitment. In fact, it makes the miners, farmers, and the last layer apparently made of igneous rock. It's simultaneously the strongest and the weakest form uh, of this. Is this how we should see it? It's strong because it has a foundation politician. in popular consent. We should it's weak because the shadow of illegitimacy hangs over every leadership action. Um, Democracy cannot be Cruel caricatures leadership. follow leaders, but it's a very peculiar form of leadership. The title reads goes for the guise radio of representation. Rudd's secret surgery extras. This is a curious concept, here. one that presents Kevin an Rudd's character set, flaws are linked to his body parts and displayed for public amusement. My favourite, as you can see, is the bigger eye. <laughs> We have Candu John. Campbell, <coughs> apparently me. full of um, energy. John has shown yet an army uniform democratic leadership his previous career has received insufficient. A brave little soldier. I want to take a few minutes now to restate the core problem so we're absolutely clear about the core what problem of democratic make leadership. Of this gap between what leaders, we argue, for face from what the leadership. Get. For, for non-democratic regimes, for the example, the words of the the founder of modern Gaki core are democratic regimes. These problems generally once revolve around like questions of leadership. If nobody's afraid selection, of me, I mean, according to certain when I say something to make it like easier for me to govern, bloodline, I have to be wealth, taken seriously. class, or general fitness. As these cartoons show, this is a question of who should we certainly do not fear our leaders in a democracy. Only and if, democracy, as Nicole put it, power is never has ridiculous. a problem with leadership as such. Then we must we conclude that doubting whether like anyone other than the people for they are constantly subject to ridicule. Democracies need good, good rulers, as so John the said, but and give them authority to govern. Wrong with our leaders. They confront I think the we need to dilemma of reconciling leadership why do we with treat an amazing principle way. of democracy, popular sovereignty. It or may surprise you that this principle asserts, as John indicated, the right of the people to receive rule very little and rejects any societal the rankings for implying the existence of the remedy of the class. themes that my colleague John Kane will address. Popular sovereignty, informed by the fundamental democrat democratic idea of the college, asserts that no one has a natural or historical right. The consequence of which is Thank that you, every hey. person must Thank have that right equally. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But if all have an equal right to vote, seems to want us the to question of uh, democracy inevitably becomes um, how are all they're frequently subject to speaking we disrespect them at will. Um, however, here we have let me to remind him, since he's free of course, democracy to me for whatever goes wrong in this election. broad answers to the question. How often we as democrats the first is feel disappointed all should in our rule. leaders. Sometimes and therefore, we have to rest on great hopes. The alternative is only some sometimes these disappointments accumulate. And turn into disillusion democracy. And then let's examine each to invest invest in doing so we won't make the overall argument that there's no single satisfactory basis for justifying leadership in democracies. And we wind up expecting nothing at all from them. 
the ubiquitous... Now, may I refer you exactly. here, at the start, in a direct democracy, where everyone takes part in ruling, everyone is a federalism leader. project. Made this the front seems to solve the problem weekend, of democratic um, leadership. Can I acknowledge the but leader of that uh, project, uh, Professor Brown? First, there's the problem of size and feasibility. It's very interesting. Think of the, the modern context. The headline in the Australian was, New has faith in political leaders collapses. Million. The survey showed that two-thirds of Australians did not believe our federal Great system of governance was working well. You see the trend. Our confidence in the federal government here with India, the effective tier most populous democracy in the world, 1.2 billion people. It plummeted from 50% in 2008 uh, clearly to only 29% today. today. I've seen those contexts. Now, more worrying than Still that some people was an apparent decline in grassroots democracy, democracy itself. Or people power. But a significant rise in the numbers believing and democracy works poorly. An aspiration and a decline everybody. in the numbers of those who think it works well. Can't we perhaps use technology now, to solve the problem? Can't we use the web? The democratic citizens are free to despise and revile their current for crop of leaders so we can vote the system itself on a Saturday night. Actually, this is one of Surely the uh, smartphone features, resilient features of democracy. Even if there is, and I would suggest that there isn't, uh, dissent in authoritarian there is a deeper governments problem is automatically to direct democracy in that any app could not solve. Down and power. that, I suggest, is the appears, problem because the regime itself is that direct we democracy, away with it, we rather than solving the problem of leadership, the actually conceals it. Nevertheless, it's an ominous sign. Let me explain what I mean. Disillusion with the leadership starts mean that all cannot govern itself. Or dedicate cynicism time about to democratic leadership, Some, especially in troubled bring times, on for consideration examples of Greece at the moment or Spain, assemblies of people a clear cannot be democratic government, those but must be periodically reconvened by an executive in the body that, in the nature of things, indeed, will be the main initiator of, of motions for general review. Now, we haven't reached that level since in agreement by all the yet, seldom. If it, we can if hardly say that all is well. Actual decisions we have two leaders will come down Canberra, to majority rule, seen how however you want to with each other to see who can be the, the most unpopular. majority will therefore be an essential feature of the politics. we have a couple of ex-leaders waiting in the wings. All these Probably factors will serve to introduce leaders into a direct democracy, even so if they're given an innocuous titles such as who we trust secretary or chairperson or first citizen. Now these are at all times before I'm sure. So the problem for leaders in democracy is that their authority and legitimacy cannot simply be just an exaggerated version even if everyone understands the normal democratic distrust as leaders only by asserting that they are not. We as democratic citizens usually hope for a good deal from our leaders. But we also typically anticipate our hopes will be dashed. Except perhaps in the very small We half anticipate that our leaders, in the whatever they promise at the start, the problem, will disappoint us in the end. I want to give Hope. you an example of this. Change, audacity, change you can believe in, so on. Why should this um, be so? This draws on research Even from that we hold colleague Daniela Lee Brown. The best possible Thank you, Daniela, political system. your book on Marcos. One we often um, urge on non democratic The inherent problems of leadership direct democracy. If and democracy is so good, then surely it should be seen in the case of subcommandante Marcos. Who took up the cause Let me suggest a couple of, of the Mayan people of Chiapas province for this in their land rights distrust. revolt in the Mexican government in 1990. The first accuses the character the of the people who go into democratic politics. Itself. The second looks the character ideas of an empowered civil society, anti-authoritarianism, well, the first ex and the rejection of predetermined political doctrines. To put it quite simply, the mysterious Marcos rapidly became a somewhat people. cultish figure internationally. People who are interested in gaining authority and use power of new media to are likely to be a certain type of person. Ambitious, and by his adoption hungry, of a so mass persona, persona that was meant to Moreover, be Moreover, in the grubby business of politics, they the must nation. compete for power with people very much like themselves. The ski mask in Mexico, Whether you would have to agree as a kind of dedication to the cause. It's not surprising, then, that political contests should be dominated by pettiness. Despite the fact that all of Marcos's acts are those of a leader, attack, he and his supporters insisted that he be always referred to as the spokesperson of the Zapatistas never if is If the leader. prime motivation is power, then Marcos's political, political writings power included will parables meant to appeal to indigenous culture to a and conversations power. with an imaginary beetle now, we've certainly called seen enough Dorito, which you see attack in the slide, that beetle is called Dorito, in who in exposed times. his weaknesses to lend and constantly some punctured credibility. his pretensions to and indeed, it's quite normal for democratic glorification. To attribute uh, base Marcos is understandably trying to avoid traditional Latin American cordialismo or strong man leadership. Leadership. They're too busy feathering well their own lift nest to so on. But as his very face but I'm and to bet appearance that any shows, citizen randomly he chosen, cannot help but he became stand personally out, acquainted especially with when he's attempting not to lead. lead. But find just the usual range of characters you find anywhere. The slow and the quick, the remarkable, the unremarkable. So now I want to take a few minutes to talk about representatives. The selfish and the generous, the other arrow. The aggressive ones and the conciliators. 
the alternative to direct democracy, what well, even the best of almost all no modern doubt, democracies have some is ruled by some and failings, on our behalf. As we all do. In practice, this means people. But if we won't find any pervasively wicked or characteristics among representative, representative class, in representative we democracies, we have a choice of selecting our representatives in two ways. Leaders. The first is by we lot, claim that the most important and the second is by election. Is into the nature of democracy, as we will so. see, each form is beset with its own. And we're not arguing that character is relevant. Far from it. We all lot. peer constantly through the revealing yet obscuring. Selection by lot, media. where chance to try and discern the real character is the, is the most democratic are they because it gives everyone an equal opportunity and thus implicitly assumes no significant difference deeply, among democratic candidates. However, we, may we want to go beyond that obvious fact and, and argue that leadership in a democracy you know, demands you numbers a certain kind of leader. Winner, very it demands winner one above all the country who instinctively week, understands, or, year, or at least can be. learn on the But as this very title suggests, very few people seem to favour this form of leadership selection. Surprise, surprise. As a political system, uh, no academic as a has political <laughs> supported it, and certainly no. What we're uh, saying is that all democratic process. leaders, this rejection may indicate the reluctance of even radical general problem tends to accept that a leader need not this possess any special I, qualities. I suspect that we're all vaguely aware of, but we never quite. Election of representatives appears, the appears to be the next, after next lecture, most democratic is the method of ruling in turn and choosing leaders. In representative democracies, leaders are popularly elected and remain accountable to the people's judgment to write the book. and ultimate authority. Both Should they fail to in please or exceed their authority, the people one day, may dismiss we do a book them on at the next election. In this I way, the popular principle, to death, for sure. the, the principle of but popular sovereignty can be said so we did some to have been research reconciled with the need and, for um, surprised Of course, elections and constituencies may be organised in many different and complicated ways, and arguments continue to be about democratic leadership is democratic, for example, proportional whole volumes out there, modern volumes, very thick ones, various preferential democratic theory. Where's the political not a single history has witnessed the steady yeah. development now this scene, of successful elections involving an ever-expanding franchise and a gradual reduction until in the formal qualification discussion demanded of candidates? Um, this we is widely and justly heralded as a triumph for representative democracy. There's no contemporary representative no democracy contemporary is, however, at some tension with the idea of popular reason. rule. Because leadership is why. a problem for democratic people. Firstly, representative democracy is not ruled by the people, but rather role ruled leaders. with the consent of the matter plainly, such consent democracy being granted or withdrawn. But it has no clear leaders. theoretical place for it. Secondly, the fact that leaders inevitably and expectedly exercise Abraham Lincoln more famously said, on policy democracy is rule of the people, violate by the, the people, of for the people. Equality. Now, the effect of these compromises on the principle leader, of popular much rule to is to engender a deep seat But where in that ringing formula of people about their elected is there a space for leadership? No matter how fairly and securely the foundational they principles of democracy are simply they inevitably sovereignty face of the people, a recurring, which means the people are the true rulers. Their and authority, though genuine, remains challengeable each time class it is exercised, and with any decision liable to be taken on the grounds of its is merely a sign of our John local Howard's decision to go to war in Iraq equality. and Obliged's decision to sell state but assets, but Julie Gillard's carbon tax, against the are all of recent instances of such challenges to democratic leaders. While it also presents the threat it's that strong leader, for this reason that all democratic leaders constantly defer to the wisdom Democratic people. leadership is thus always shown by phrase, ubiquitous phrase, and never vox, popularly vox dei, which and uh, by a permanent with effectively of means the word of the people is the word of God. As Democrats, therefore, something we have of the a problem reconciling Even when thrown out of office, no leader, democracy, however tempted, ever claims, sovereignty, well, that was a dumb and decision by the electorate. In danger of popular sovereignty. Instead, we always and get we this. See the, depth of this problem, the people have we look spoken, at the way contemporary and I literature their has dealt with it or failed to. This makes democratic leadership, now, as John suggested, in representative democracy, almost no a particularly difficult form of leadership to master, precisely because the leader is always a representative. Century. But what and exactly does this mean? Schumpeter and and what implications does it have for the legitimacy for of democratic what leader? They called elite democracy. As we will argue, there is no now, single in elite legitimate form of representation. Superior leaders are this chosen is the periodically problem by the people. Leadership. And chosen precisely in fact, on the grounds of their as I'll demonstrate in a few minutes, there are three distinct versions to rule of the judge form fit and function of democratic representation. So what Sartori said must reckon with, and I quote, Minorities These who count for much and summarize or to and with majorities are called agent representation, power. mirror representation, and American representation. Key. Let's examine them in turn to see what they mean. We need strong elite leadership, leadership to forestall a natural propensity in democracy 
toward an agent representative DK is someone instructed to present my specific views and defend my interests. The elitist model implies agents who are told what to do claim to have a quote unquote and mandate to exclude them from the people. everyday political process. As agents, they will certainly be rejected if they don't follow more democratic and blind theorists. Do something extremely unjust. Taxes and a war. Nor was it surprising given the treaty theory and then not proceed so much with leadership. After all, I'm the boss and I employ these people. But evade the elitist logic. Therefore, in some ways, the agent looks more like a servant than a leader. They began instead to explore more. If I'm wise, I'll choose an intelligent agent who understands what I want, even if not given strict instructions. Like so that an agent who is trustworthy and honest will guard my welfare, even at his or her expense. Such an agent is implicitly never acknowledged to others who world. lack such admiration. Was to delineate a form of democracy leaders as agents that would are thus ironically undemocratic, the because, like the famous leaders. fictional servant Jeeves, the and we think they managed to combine discreet civility with. Was it if only everyone could be involved in decision making, democracies wouldn't need leaders at all? Now the, the problem with form of representation I want to talk about is mirror representation. The in mirror representation, electors, set up electors choice choose leaders who resemble them in some important aspect. The assumption, I think, is that people who look like me will somehow represent my interests and aspirations better Vladimir than those Putin, who don't. On the one hand, it's also or government by a permanent 2020 representation. committee on the other. Mirror representation no, appears the most thing. democratic because it retains the ocean these the are of identity between representative and representative. And they don't help us to understand the way in a sense the leader I've chosen is me, democracy. or at least in some real Contrary to the presumptions of participatory Democrats, if we most only had twins, to see as we strong see from as a picture, the case of the Polish at president, the same time, and Kaczynski, who died unfortunately in a Most people regard powerful and least and his democratic brother Jaroslaw Kaczynski, who in other words, yes to leadership elites. The inability of either identity to representation to be seen in now in New Zealand, means where the Maori have since 1867 had seats reserved for them in Parliament, on the assumption that they needed unlike. representation as a distinct people. The if Democrat, there is Democrats genuinely need and want white leaders, Hari, we are now even while the being wary of the potential threat they Parliament represent, Party. What are they to do? Indeed, we celebrate leaders now, because the of this identity politics. Don't has been think of Barack okay, Obama as the first African American president. Senator Neville we tried to reduce the, the leadership Aboriginal risk Australian by placing our leaders under Julia Gillard controls, is the first set limits for their authority, and make them Rice, accountable for any exercise. General. The ultimate control mechanism Indeed, is regular course, demands for diversity in all leaders all testify to the ability to dismiss leaders for unsatisfactory performance. But can the fact we always that never assume the that people who look like us have our welfare at heart? And you can dismiss so Is it not true that once in power, yet, persons, then, however, like us, may often go there in popular and legal control we've devised? In any case, and nevertheless, nevertheless can we with any an confidence say what a woman leader, for example, Granting should do in any authority case. to particular individuals, even if only for some defined period, seems to violate the spirit of popular sovereignty? The third Some have argued, indeed, that between elections, what in reality we force to leadership endure, I want to is in representation I want to discuss. Third we are placed final. under the temporary is rule of our so-called trustee, who often act in ways we don't like. That popular the trustee sovereignty is may a true leader, idea, someone I respect theory, for possessing say, qualities but in the end, and virtues that I greatly admire, but I like of myself. In democratic terms, someone who now, embodies... We respond to this view by asserting our belief. It is uh, Edmund Burke's famous trustee who will pursue the good the popular as he or she is not firmly just sees it irrespective life. of the wishes. Nor and is it a sound ideal that hasn't quite been realised yet. Burke, who was an Irish It's rather a principle that operates continuously in the his famous statement to the electors in Bristol declared that while he accepted their wishes and opinions and interests to carry them greatest weight, as he put it, is real. It, is real. He could not sacrifice his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his effects are most clearly seen, we say. Quote, in the way your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. As they do and he betrays best. instead of serving you this if he sacrifices it to your opinion. This democratic tension makes the ground on which the democratic leader stands were echoed by Tony Blair insecure. in his resignation speech in, in fact, 2007. In fact, it makes democratic leadership the most difficult quote, of all kinds I ask of you to accept one thing. And it's simultaneously the strongest and the weakest, weakest form of leadership. Such it's a leader on claiming of superiority in wisdom and judgment clearly tests because the shadow of illegitimacy hangs over every leadership action. Similarly, more recently, Julie Gillard has responded leadership. to questions of ALP. But it's very peculiar by form of leadership. She doesn't govern by polls, but by what's right for the people. This is a curious concept. One that presents an interesting set of conundrums. Each of these concept conceptions of representative, mirror, agent, or trustee, offers a different basis of leadership. <laughs> the trouble with them 
is not just that each presents problems of democratic compromise, but as Democrats, we tend not to distinguish <coughs> clearly between um, them. John has shown how we're liable to demand that our leaders display all has three qualities of representation at once. I want to take a few minutes now to restate. We want our leaders to be just so like us, but also much better than the core problem of democratic. We want a genuinely all great political leader leader who is nevertheless humble and has a leadership. common touch. For, for we want someone who will do our bidding, listen to us, and not break promises. Yet we will hold in contempt a leader who merely follows these problems polls, generally has no vision. And refuses to make tough election according to this conflation. Incidentally, is not surprising line, since identity, wealth, servantship, and, and moral strength are all necessarily combined. This is a question in the of the idea of leadership. It also points to the perpetual problem of democracy that democratic leaders has a problem with leadership. Leaders as in a representative such, democracy are, are made out of anyone to the of of democratic illegitimacy. Democracy nations are rulers are changeable and but giving them authority to govern, they shift they from one type of representative the dilemma of other, reconciling leadership as well as irrefutable, because no single incontestable basis exists for ruling people. people and democracy. This principle asserts, as John indicated, the right of this the politics of legitimacy and rejects any always the ranking and be interwoven the existence of distinct government. With politics as usual, shaping the nature and efficacy of the sovereign action formed by the fundamental democrat democratic To see this in greater quality, detail, John asserts Cain that no one has the natural or historical right and truth-telling for democratic leaders. The consequence of which is that every person must have that right. <laughs> but if all have an equal right to do, the question for democracy inevitably becomes how are Those all contradictory expectations speaking, that Hayek has noted that we impose on our leaders has important Here we have implications to every aspect of democratic options leadership in democracy. Different ones in our Two broad answers to the question I posed. The first is all should rule, um, and therefore we have to take rules. notes. So I want to focus the on the one topic is only to some should rule the on our behalf. It's the moral topic of truthful democracy. Let's now, examine each in turn. In doing so, we want to make the overall argument the there's no single satisfactory basis for justifying leadership in democracy. I hear you all thinking, what's remarkable, <laughs> what's remarkable about that? The, you, you but that's because you've all grown example. very cynically accustomed to democracy. In a direct politics. democracy, where Probably everyone takes part in ruling, ruling, everyone is a leader. When politicians are lying, this militant. seems to solve the problem of democratic leadership. But our distrust is but actually remarkable. If you step back and think First, about. there's the problem of the size and peculiar virtue of democratic government is supposed to think lie the in this demand for open, New Zealand has a population of honesty. 4 million, all of which seem Australia, to make truthful three, a central value. Canada, 35, lies may serve Britain, tyrants, 62. but nothing should, in principle, see the trend. be hidden from the sovereign people. I finish people. up here with India, unless it can be demonstrated, the populous that democracy in the world, 1.2 billion people, protects the people's uh, interests. Clearly inconceivable. Now, obviously, no democratic leader would context. ever explicitly argue. That Still, some, some people dream of grassroots democracy or people power. <coughs> you may recall that Joseph and Goebbels once recommended and the value of the political value of the big lie. Told loudly and repeated use technology to solve the problem. Any democratic leader who confessed to such an e democracy would pay an immediate Why isn't that someone invented an price. app for this? I must know so we can vote for on Saturday night. To this from the recent US presidential Surely there's a election campaign. smartphone solution to this. Mitt Romney's pollster, Even if there is, Newhouse, and I boasted, would suggest that there isn't. We're not going to let our campaign there is be dictated the problem by fact to direct democracy that any fact app checkers are those solve. annoying newspaper and people. And that, I suggest, is the everything problem politicians say and then award that a direct democracy Nokia's rather than solving the problem of leadership. New House was admitting that Romney intended to lie. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean. Question, Practical right? limitations mean actually, that all like cannot important. govern or dedicate Such frankness is actually rule. atypical. Some, Let me give not you a all, must bring example. matters on for consideration. Some of you may remember agenda. Tony Abbott confessing to Assemblies of people cannot be continuous authority, but must be periodically reconvened He went a bit further than that in the nature of things. He said it was therefore best to take only his pre-prepared scripted for general review. As possible. Since agreements this, of by course, immediately became the basis of Labour Party attacks on his actual decisions will come down to majority rule, however, however you want to define majority. Show that around 40 percent persuading a majority will therefore be an essential feature of refreshing politics. That a politician All these tell factors the truth. will serve to introduce Namely, leaders into direct unfair. democracy, even if they're given innocuous titles such as real, secretary irony of or politics. chairperson. Or on the one first hand, citizen, it affirmed the importance of heard those terms before, I'm sure. And so the, the problem other, for leaders in the direct democracy is that their authority that and legitimacy more cannot reach, simply be publicly acknowledged, even if everyone understands the reality. They can that's true that politicians caught out in the blatant lie soon find themselves 
any uh, public admission to the country is a usurpation of popular sovereignty. Julia Gillard's and broken promise on the carbon tax, by the way, is an except perhaps one. in the very smallest because it raises the question leadership of whether our political leaders the must never be allowed to change democracy. their minds. I want to give you no, an example. They should be. If shifting circumstances make them unable to keep a promise, um, this draws um, on research from our colleague Daniela Di Paramus. Thank you, Daniela. Evidence in your book on the Marcos. Of their original position. Um, the and inherent problems of leadership and direct democracy and the if, difficulty in avoiding them can be seen in the case of Supplementante Marcos, the who took up the cause of the Mayan people of Chiapas province in their the land rights revolt in the Mexican government in 1995. The Zapatista movement, as it calls itself, Espouses ideas of an empowered civil society, why anti authoritarianism, and the rejection of President Ronald Reagan, who was an anti tax conservative. The mysterious Marcos was rapidly became a somewhat popular figure internationally by virtue of his skillful use of the new media to promote the Zapatista cause and by his adoption of a mask persona that was meant to depersonalize him and thus avoid the leadership in the It all depends on how the ski mask in Mexico, you would have to agree, is a kind of dedication to the cause. We should note, however, that in politics, most people are lies. Despite the fact that all of Marcos's acts are those of a leader, do discriminate between he the and his supporters serious. insisted that he be always judged, referred for example, to as the spokesperson taken them into of the Zapatistas, never as a leader. The of lies, there will be Marcos's political writings as were, included parables meant to appeal to indigenous culture and conversations with an imaginary beetle called Dorito, which you will see in the slide, that the beetle was called Dorito, who exposed his weaknesses and constantly punctured his pretensions to Personal now, unless per extreme uh, everyday circumstances, uh, people Marcos feel they is have understandably trying to avoid traditional Latin American people could feel they have little option or strong man leadership, who they suspect as well as lift tell them lift the whole vanguardism. They're perfectly but it's his very face and appearance and shows he cannot help of but stand out, out especially when he's attempting question. not to lead. Evasions and avoidances are the hallmark of the typical political response. Giving skeptical so now I want to take a few minutes to talk about representative democracy, which is the other devious. arrow you recall from the slide. What we're pointing to here is the alternative of direct democracy, democracy. What we find in almost all modern democracies is this hypocrisy is sometimes taken on our as a sign of a current. In practice, this means people malaise, rule through their representatives or practically speaking as representative democracies. But it's actually a permanent in representative democracies, democracies, we have a choice of selecting our representatives the case of in two ways. Leader, the first is by lot, Baslav Havel, and the second is by election. Who came to the presidency as we will of see, each form is determined to abide by the value of democratic leadership. Havel was originally a playwright lot. who was swept into leadership during the Velvet Revolution against Congress Selection power. by lot, where chance determines no the obvious is, for is the, power, is the most democratic as because it gives everyone an equal opportunity. Good policies, and thus he wrote, implicitly come only from good and no sincerely motivated people among employing these means. We may apply a rejection of Machiavellian tactics. Again, the Saturday night thing. You the know, simple fact is, when you numbers and you come up quote, winner, very, that directness can never be established by indirection or, or truth year, through lies. Be. But as, as the democratic title suggests, very few people seem to favour this form of leadership to live in truth. Surprise. And uh, declares his no faith academic that has the world might actually support it, and the certainly no uh, interest the power of the truthful word. This rejection may the indicate the reluctance of even radical egalitarians to accept no that guns, a leader no need not power, possess any no special qualities and dealings. Now, have the I election of representatives words, appears to be the next, next most democratic Perhaps. method of ruling in turn and choosing leaders? Is that not what we In representative democracies, leaders are popularly elected and remain accountable to the people's judgment and ultimate authority. Should they fail to please or exceed their authority, the people may dismiss them but the at the next election. In this way, the, popular principle, of jobs the, the principle of popular sovereignty can be said he to have the been reconciled with the NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Pact. And of course, some the main players the constituencies may be organized in NATO. many different and complicated ways, and arguments continue about which are the most democratic, for example, proportional representation, first past the post, or various preferential systems. Why? Because the nation Western political power. history has witnessed the steady development no of successful elections involving an ever-expanding franchise and gradual reduction in the form of qualification demanded of candidates. This is widely and justly heralded as a triumph for representative democracy. 
Represented democracies, however, there are very powerful forces in modern democracies that permanently challenge Havel's standard of truthfulness. Firstly, representative democracy is not ruled by the people, many but rather to be ruled with the economic. consent of the people. Such consent being the granted price of plainly speaking one's mind can be very high. high. When a Secondly, the fact that leaders inevitably product, and expectedly exercise more influence on policy than ordinary citizens seems to violate the fundamental problem of because your party the support of the majority of the electorate. The effect of these compromises on the principle of popular rule is to engender a deep-seated and democracy among the people about their elected leaders. Pandering to the people, no matter how fairly and securely they may be elected to please their sovereign, they inevitably face a recurring intractable problem of legitimacy. To which part Their authority, of the though genuine, must they remains challengeable if it's to be each time it is exercised. With now, the, any voice decision people, liable the voice of the people may be the grounds voice of its God, democratic God, legitimacy. Said, John Howard's decision to avoid many Iraq, Iraq and Bly's decision to sell state assets, divided into Julie diverse Gillard's carbon tax, widely are all recent instances of such challenges to democratic legitimacy. Leaders have no choice it's but to shape their perhaps for this reason that all democratic around. leaders constantly defer to the This means they must often blandly of obfuscate people. issues. Rather the famous Latin phrase, policy, phrase vox populi vox dei, which offend someone. Uh, is sometimes they will means feel the that word of the say people is the really word of believe. God. Captures something of the shape shifting during the Even US when thrown out of office, was a no leader, however tempted, ever claims had to appeal to one well, that was a dumb decision by the electorate. Instead, we always get this. And then to a much the broader people audience, have spoken, and I respect their judgment. The puzzle of the this makes democratic became, leadership, as John suggested, in the really? representative democracy, what he really believe? a particularly difficult Which form of leadership to master, precisely because the leader is always a representative. But what exactly does this mean? Romney's case was and what somewhat extreme, but all our leaders have frequent occasions to spin the truth. As we will argue, there is no single legitimate form of representation. The of managing the media. This is the central By problem the way, of democratic leadership. Is something that leaders absolutely in must fact, do. As I'll demonstrate in a few minutes, there are three distinct the versions is that if they of proper the form and function of democratic and representation well, that have been like identified, the and this is the problem. Of being nothing. These. To summarise, or to I think we may take it as a general truth: agent representation, mirror representation, and trustee mean, representation. Mean what they Let's examine them in turn to see what they mean and what they say about the legitimacy of democratic leadership. Democratic politics is not, nor can it ever be, quite innocent. An agent representative is someone instructed to present my Even leaders who take the responsibility and to govern, defend my interests. Govern for the common agents good, who are told what to do claim to have a quote unquote mandate. Have reasons to dissent. This is not As just agents, they will certainly be rejected if they don't follow instructions. For example, if they promise to do but something, also because the leaders judge taxes what the common and good war, actually requires, uh, sign a treaty, and then not proceed. The multitude will approve. After all, I'm the boss. And I employ this. Yeah. So the argument comes. something of a trick. Therefore, in some ways, the agent looks more like a servant. Navigating between the various contradictions that Hegel. If I'm wise, I'll choose an intelligent agent who understands what I want, even if not given. And the use of different legitimating justifications. So that an agent who's trustworthy and honest will guard my welfare, even at his or her own expense. Such an agent is obviously superior to others who lack such a quality. Talented because leaders as agents are thus ironically undemocratic be because, like the famous fictional servant Jeeves, may thus be portrayed, they manage to combine discrete civility with evidence of responsible exercise and democratic accountability. Again, John Howard was a past master at managing. The next form of representation I want to talk about is mirror representation. Those who feel, on the other hand, in mirror representation, that they must electors, what they electors choose are leaders who resemble them in some important aspect. May instead, instead the assumption I think is that people who look like me will somehow represent I my interests, in hopes, and aspirations and better than those who don't. This can work. It's also incidentally called identity representation. Precisely because democratic citizens. Mirror representation appears the most democratic because it retains the, like the notion of identity between of representative and represented. In a sense, the leader I've chosen is me, or at least now maneuvering between way. different like legitimating that. arguments. Is an if we only had twins, skills, as we see from some an, the picture, some manage much the case of the Polish president Lech Kaczynski, By the way, we need to say they don't pay attention in a 2010 to the polls. You airline sure accident like and his brother Yaroslav No democratic Kaczynski leader can afford not to follow what the polls are telling him or her about public opinion. The influence I, identity true, representation can be seen in New Zealand, where the Maori have since 1867 had seats reserved for them in Parliament on the assumption that they needed representation as a distinct people. The photograph there is of Honey Hari Mira now of the Manu Party, of our leaders' veracity.
presents opportunities. Indeed, we celebrate the leaders outsiders. because of this identity. Outsiders may gain office. Think of Barack Obama as the first African man, not politician. Senator Neil Obama is the first who shared the general outrage at the seat Julia Gillard is the first female current current leadership. Quentin Bryce. Pauline Hansen is a relevant, relevantly indeed developer. regular Relative demands for diversity in all leaders all testify to the power of mirror representation. I actually remember. But can we always assume that people power. who look like us have and our welfare? Like Raj Bukhanik said to me, Thank "Is it not true that once in power, a person, however like us, may often go their own way?" In any case, soon found, can we with any confidence say what a plain woman leader, for example, should do in any particular case? From, from those parts of the population who didn't share her attitudes. Even she had to moderate, that is, soften her rhetoric. The third example. And thus the bout of the necessities of democratic form of leadership I want to represent. A reputation want for discuss. plain speaking third and final, is a good thing to have is in democracy. That of a but it takes exceptional talent. And no doubt a good dollop of hypocrisy. The, the trustee is a true leader, someone I respect for possessing Ruth qualities Grant, and virtues that I greatly admire, but she knows like that myself. And I quote, in democratic terms, someone to eliminate who manipulation and hypocrisy in effect the best politics would require it is uh, more egalitarian. Edmund Burke's famous trustee but who will pursue the good as he or she firmly sees it, irrespective of the wishes but and the desires of the problem. electorate. Enlarged autonomy. Burke, who was an Irish statesman, a philosopher in the 18th century, in his famous statement to his electors in Bristol, to the declared that while he accepted their wishes and opinions and interests to carry the greatest weight of democracy, he could not Think sacrifice his unbiased Charles opinion, his mature judgment, and his life constitution to, to make him a life Quote, leader. Your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. It's undemocratic. And he betrays, instead of serving the you, he sacrifices the demands that democracy places on its leadership. These sentiments, incidentally, were echoed by Tony Blair in his resignation itself. speech in 2007 when he compelling said, leaders quote, perpetually to I ask you to accept one thing, without ever hand on heart, it I did what I thought was right. Such a leader in claiming or displaying people, superiority in wisdom and judgment speech. clearly tests the democratic principle of so, equality. The final answer to the question, what's wrong Similarly, with the leaders, recently, is, Julie Gillard no. has responded to questions we make the place for leadership, leadership by saying she doesn't politics. govern by polls, but by what's right for them. That's why democratic leadership is not, or not usually, of the heroic kind. Much as we like Each of these concept conceptions of representative, the democratic citizens, mirror, agent, wish or that it was seen. Offers a different basis of leadership different. legitimacy in a Sometimes rather demeaning. The trouble with them is not just that each presents problems of democratic compromise, but as Democrats, we tend not to see which clearly between them. With which Hay began this. We're liable to demand that our leaders display all three qualities of representation at once. Let me explain what I mean. He wrote, "We want our leaders to be just like us, but also much better than us." Why? We want because a genuinely great the leader control, who is nevertheless humble and has a another, common touch. We time. want someone who will do our bidding, listen to us, and not break that promises, not yet we will hold in contempt a leader who, who merely follows the polls, has no vision, and refuses to make tough and unpopular decisions. As the bouncing this conflation, show, incidentally, this is not surprising since identity, servantship, and leading moral strength in a are in fact all necessarily combined in the democratic experience. idea of leadership. It demands a certain quiet it also points to the perpetual problem of trust that democratic group. leaders must manage. But it's seldom publicly leaders in a representative democracy are made democratic leaders susceptible have no to the choice but to navigate as best they can between because the such poles accusations and are changeable and contradictory because they shift from one type of representative leadership to the other, as well as irrefutable, because no single incontestable basis exists for leadership role in democracy. And that's why it's so difficult to be Important. a democratic leader. This so politics of legitimacy will always accompany and be interwoven our leaders more slack? with politics as usual, lecture? shaping the nature and no. efficacy of the political practice. Our democracy. duty as democratic citizens to give them to the see this in greater detail. John Cain will but now it examine the importance the of trust to better understand and the onerous and contradictory demands that we, we ourselves, impose on our leaders. As thank you, John. And thank you, Haig, on behalf of all of us. That was a fantastic um, start to the series. Tonight, I take notes. I, look so I want to focus next on book. one topic that goes to the heart of the issue of trust. It's the moral issue. topic. <laughs> Now, it's remarkable I was waiting there for some answers. I was waiting there for the all the problems we resolved. Because what I like about books 
In the final chapter, here thinking, it's, here's, here's the problem, here's what you have to do. That. No, but that's hanging. because you've all grown very cynically okay. accustomed to democratic they, politics. They conclude, there really is you probably no, agree with the old jerk. How do you know when politicians are lying? No lips are Look, that was a, a fantastic lecture. But I'm sure we all learned a lot. Now we've got to go and buy the book. Uh, and read the the virtual democratic um, government is supposed please to join me in thanking in our speakers open, again and please join me for the, the reception we're going to have next door uh, when we have a particularly value. interesting uh, political Lies may serve tyrants, yeah, but, but nothing right. should in thank principle you John. Thank you, be hidden from <laughs> sovereign people unless it can be demonstrated that limited secrecy in certain areas protects the people's best interests. Now, obviously, no democratic leader would ever explicitly argue, as some dictators have done, the necessity of lying. <coughs> you may recall that Joseph Goebbels once recommended the value, the political value of the big lie, told loudly and repeated often. Any democratic leader who confessed to such a belief would pay an immediately, immediate political price. I must note one <coughs> remarkable exception to this from the recent US presidential election campaign. Mitt Romney's pollster, a man called Neil Newhouse, boasted, and I quote, we're not going to let our campaign be dictated by fact checkers. Fact checkers are those annoying newspaper people who scrutinize everything politicians say and then award a certain number of Pinocchios for accuracy. Newhouse was admitting that Romney intended to lie. It's an interesting question whether this had some impact actually on his electoral fortune. Such frankness is actually atypical. Let me give you a more telling example. Some of you may remember Tony Abbott confessing to an interviewer that sometimes, in the heat of discussion, he went a bit further than the truth demanded. He said it was therefore best to take only his pre-prepared scripted statements as gospel. This, of course, immediately became the basis of Labour Party attacks on his untrustworthiness. Curiously, however, polls showed that around 40% of Australians thought it, quote, refreshing that a politician should tell the truth. Namely, that politicians often fib. The incident revealed a central irony of democratic politics. On the one hand, it affirmed the importance of truth-telling as a political value, and on the other, displayed the public expectation that that value would be more honoured in the breach than the observance. Now, it's true that politicians caught out in a blatant lie soon find themselves uh, with acute political problems. Julia Gillard's broken promise on the carbon tax, by the way, is an interesting one, because it raises the question of whether our political leaders must never be allowed to change their minds. Now, of course, they should be, if shifting circumstances make them unable to keep a promise, um, or if they have become convinced of the weight of contrary evidence of the incorrectness of their original position. And, in fact, they will be allowed to if if they explain to the public immediately and frankly precisely why the promise can't be fulfilled. Failure to do so allows the opposition to label the original promise nothing but an expedient lie and to inflict considerable political damage. It's interesting to speculate why, another example in the United States, President Ronald Reagan, who was an anti-tax conservative, was forgiven for reluctantly raising taxes to counter a ballooning deficit while his successor, George H.W. Bush, was defeated in the election largely because he broke a promise. Read my lips, no new taxes. It all depends on how the leader manages the matter, but it has to be managed. We should note, however, that in politics, there are lies and there are damned lies. People do discriminate between degrees of seriousness. If they judge, for example, that their leaders have taken them into a disastrous war on the basis of lies, there will be consequences. As there were for the leaders of almost every country that supported the Iraq invasion of 2003. Actually, the sole exception to that was our own John Howard, who very candidly played the issue without harm to his own leadership. Now, in less extreme everyday circumstances, people feel they have People feel they have little option but to tolerate leaders who they suspect seldom tell them the whole truth. They're perfectly frustratingly aware that politicians are incapable of giving a straightforward answer to a simple question. Evasions and avoidances are the hallmark of the typical political response, giving skeptical listeners an impression of moral slipperiness or even calculated deviousness. 
What we're pointing to here is a prevalent hypocrisy in democratic politics. This hypocrisy is sometimes taken as a sign of a current democratic malaise, what's been labelled elsewhere as a democratic deficit. But it's actually a permanent feature of democracy, we think. It's instructive to look at the case of a democratic leader, Václav Havel, who came to the presidency of Czechoslovakia determined to abide by the value of truthfulness. Havel was originally a playwright who was swept into leadership during the Velvet Revolution against communist power. Having no intrinsic love for power, he didn't regard himself as a typical devious politician. Good policies, he wrote, come only from good and sincerely motivated people, employing decent means. This implied a rejection of Machiavellian tactics. The simple fact is, Havel claimed, and I quote, that directness can never be established by indirection, or truth through lies, or the democratic spirit through authoritarian directives. The good democrat seeks to live in truth and declares his faith that the world might actually be changed by the force of truth, the power of the truthful word, the strength of a free spirit, conscience and responsibility, with no guns, no lust for power, no political wheeling and dealing. Now, have I only to read those words to hear many of you sigh? Perhaps. But well, why do you sigh if you do? Is that not what we all long for? Consider what happened to Havel when he was in power. He spoke passionately about closing down his country's huge arms industry. But the manufacture of weapons continued. Why? Because, of course, large numbers of jobs and foreign income depended on it. He desired the disbandment of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, only to become one of the main players in the Czech Republic's bid to join NATO. Because, of course, the alliance afforded many advantages. He railed at his country's nuclear power plants, but they went on operating till eventually he ceased to mention them. Why? Because the nation needed power. We could go on. No one ever doubted Havel's sincerity, not even his political opponents, but he had clearly been naive in his estimate of the freedom of action that personal disinterestedness, disinterestedness and goodness of intention could bring to a democracy. There are very powerful forces in modern democracies that permanently challenge Havel's standard of truthfulness. Our political leaders, in fact, have many incentives to be economical with the truth. The price of plainly speaking one's mind can be very high when a misspoken word becomes immediate fodder for your political opponents, aided by an intrusive sensationalist media. Perfect honesty is a problem if it costs your party the support of a majority of the electorate and denies it office. Remember now, as Haig's been saying, and I've been emphasising, in a democracy the people are sovereign. Pandering to the people, therefore, is a natural tendency of servants who need to please their sovereign, to maintain their position. And the trouble is, for the leader, to which part of the actual people must they direct their pandering if it's to be effective? Now, the voice of, people, the, voice of the people may be the voice of God, as Haig has said, but the people are a many-headed God with a multitude of voices. They're divided into diverse constituencies with widely diverging opinions and interests that can't all be met. Leaders have no choice but to shape their rhetoric to this plur plurality. This means they must often blandly obfuscate issues rather than clarify them with positive policy, because positive policy will surely offend someone. Sometimes they will feel that they must say things they don't really believe. Romney's shape-shifting during the US campaign was a direct consequence of the fact he had to appeal to one audience to win the Republican nomination, the loony fringe, if you like, and then to a much broader audience if he was going to beat Obama. The puzzle of the campaign became, who is Romney, really? And what does he really believe? Which of his variable statements were Americans supposed to take seriously? Romney's case was somewhat extreme, but all our leaders have frequent occasions to spin the truth. Spinning, indeed, becomes an art form in the business of managing the media. By the way, managing the media is something that leaders absolutely must do if they're to succeed. The irony is that if they manage the media too dedicatedly and too well, they're suspected, like the Blair government in Britain, of being nothing but spin. I think we may take it as a general truth that if our leaders occasionally say what they really mean, and mean what they actually say, they have first calculated there's some political advantage in doing so. 
Democratic politics is not, nor can it ever be, quite innocent. Even leaders who take the responsibility to govern, govern, govern for the common good with the utmost seriousness, and most of them do, have reasons to dissemble. This is not just because of the need to triangulate carefully between sectoral interests, but also because the leader's judgment of what the common good actually requires may differ from what he knows the multitude will approve. Astute leaders may manage this, it's a, something of a trick, but it's not very easy to do. Navigating between the various contradictions that Haig outlined earlier requires excellent political judgment and good timing, and the use of different legitimating justifications as the occasion suits. Leaders who feel forced to change direction in the face of damaging adverse opinion may adopt an obedient pose and assert that they are listening to the voice of the sovereign people, which it would be unforgivably arrogant of them to ignore. A U-turn may thus be portrayed not as a contemptible flip-flop, but a responsible exercise in democratic accountability. Again, John Howard was a past master at managing such reversals without paying a price. Those who feel, on the other hand, that they must continue with what they regard as a necessary course despite opposition may instead, instead stand stoutly firm and repeat the Burkean line, I do what I believe in all conscience is right for you, my fellow citizens. This can work if circumstances permit, precisely because democratic citizens also demand that their leaders, as Haig was saying, behave like stalwart leaders of genuine strength, independence, conviction and integrity. Now, manoeuvring between different legitimating arguments is an essential democratic skill that some, man some manage much better than others. By the way, when leaders say they don't pay attention to the polls, you can be sure they're lying. No democratic leader can afford not to follow what the polls are telling him or her about public opinion. This is true even if the leader courageously decides, courageously decides, at the end of the day, and all things considered, to defy the weight of public opinion because he or she believes a course of action, however unpopular, is necessary. It's worth noting that the normal democratic suspicion of our leader's veracity presents opportunities for political outsiders. Outsiders may gain office by claiming precisely that they are not politicians, merely ordinary people who share the general outrage at the deceitfulness or high-handedness of the current leadership. Pauline Hanson is a relatively, sorry, relatively recent Australian example of this sort of populism, as it's called. I actually remember the day Pauline was first elected to federal parliament and, and uh, my garage mechanic said to me, thank God, last they've, at last they've elected someone who says what we all think. Yet Pauline soon found, once she'd entered the political maelstrom, that plain speaking copped her a fearful battering from the press and from those parts of the population who didn't share her attitudes. Even she had to moderate, that is, soften her rhetoric. And thus the bout of the necessities of democratic discourse. A reputation for plain speaking is a good thing to have in a democracy, but it takes exceptional talent and no doubt a good dollop of hypocrisy to maintain it. Ruth Grant once wrote a book on political hypocrisy and she noted that, and I quote, to eliminate manipulation and hypocrisy from politics would require not more egalitarianism, but more autonomy for democratic politicians. But, here's the problem, enlarged autonomy is precisely what democratic government is designed to prevent. Any attempt to resolve the democratic leadership tension by making leaders more secure in their positions endangers the democracy. Think, for example, of Hugo Chavez's attempts to alter the Venezuelan constitution to make him a lifetime leader. Security of the leader is undemocratic. The acute and contradictory demands that democracy places on its leadership are undoubtedly a problem for the leaders, but not for democracy itself. In compelling leaders perpetually to negotiate this problem without ever finally resolving it in their own favour, democracies constantly reaffirm the sovereignty of the people, even while enjoying the benefits of leadership. So, the final answer to the question, what's wrong with our leaders, is we are. We make the practice of leadership very difficult on purpose. That's why democratic leadership is not, or not usually, of the heroic kind, much as we like to see this. Democratic leaders, indeed democratic citizens, wish that it were so. 
but the reality is generally very different, sometimes rather demeaning and embarrassing. Lee Kuan Yew's piece of wisdom, with which Hay began this lecture, is actually first articulated by Nic Niccolo Machiavelli 500 years ago. He wrote, it's better for a political leader to be feared than loved. Why? Because instilling fear was within the leader's control, while love was a gift of another that could be withdrawn at any time. That choice is not open to a democratic leader, who must of necessity strive to be loved or at least not too much hated. As the bouncing polls show, this isn't easy to achieve consistently. Leading in a democracy is in fact often an intensely humbling experience. It demands a certain quiet, tenacious heroism. We usually call it having a very thick skin, but it's seldom publicly recognised. Democratic leaders have no choice but to navigate as best they can between the twin poles of public idealism, heightened expectations, and corrosive cynicism, disappointment, disillusion, trying to temper the one while forestalling the other. It's never an easy task. And that's why it's so difficult to be a democratic leader and so very difficult to be a good one. Should we cut our leaders more slack? Is that the lesson of our lecture? No. Practically, our duty as democratic citizens to give them the hardest possible time we can. But it doesn't hurt, we believe, to better understand the onerous and contradictory demands that we, we ourselves, impose on our leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you very much for your attendance and your attention. Thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, Haig, on behalf of all of us. That was a fantastic start to the series, and I look forward to their next book, which will be devoted to academic leadership in the university. <laughs> And I was waiting there for some answers. I was waiting there for all the problems to be resolved because what I like about books in the final chapter is here's the problem, here's what you have to do. And I was left hanging and still hanging. But perhaps as they, as they conclude, there really is no conclusive answer to this. It's part of the ongoing adventure of democracy. Look, that was a, a fantastic lecture. I'm sure we all learnt a lot. Now we've got to go and buy the book uh, and read it voraciously. Um, Please join me in thanking our speakers again, and please join me for the, the reception we're going to have next door uh, when we have a particularly interesting uh, political leader to launch the book, Kevin Rudd. Thank you, John. Thank you, Haig. I'm heartfelt. <laughs>